So, thank you very much for that introduction. Especially for uh, this audience, I designed this talk to go back to the, to the basics. So, I want to talk about visualization on the one hand, and then I want to move on to basic volume rendering. So, we did a lot of application stuff, we did a lot of surgical planning, for example, but I think you've seen enough of that. So, I thought it would be nice uh, to, tell, uh, to tell a little story about where visualization comes from and what it's all about. So when you go Googling for visualization, this is unfortunately one of the links that you find on the first page. <laughs> and when you read, you read that when you are visualizing, you are admitting a powerful frequency out into the universe. <laughs> now, I hope that you realize by now this is not the type of visualization I'm going to talk about today, maybe on a different occasion. Today I'd like to talk about this type of visualization. So my most favorite definition of visualization is not that one. It's visualization is the art of turning raw data into pretty pictures. But because that sometimes gives people a too frivolous idea of what visualization is about, I instead chose this one by Carl McKinney and Scheinemann from 98, and they write, the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations of data to <laughs> amplify cognition. So what's important here is it's interactive, it's a visual representation, and the primary goal of visualization is to amplify human cognition. So that's why I think I like this definition as well. I think I'll put it in number two. Okay, and then if we analyze that a bit further into the pipeline that you see uh, down there by Tamara Minster, we see that we can break this down into the following components. So you start off with having some kind of, of data, of course, because you obviously want to visualize something. Very important, you have a task. What is the question that I'd like to answer? Or who would I like to help? What is my application? Really important to have contact with them. And finally, what is the domain of my problem, of my user? And then we're talking about what metadata is available, what semantics are, uh, are applied in my domain. And based on all of these components, you carefully design this visualization pipeline consisting of a whole lot of processing because there's data to be crunched and turned into pictures. It's a whole big data reduction step. But even more important than that is the mapping stage. And the mapping stage consists of a visual encoding and a visual metaphor. And this is where the well-trained uh, visualization professional sits down and thinks about marks and channels. Marks are just simple graphical elements such as points and lines and for example circles, um, and uh, channels are the ways in which we can modulate these marks to change their meaning. So a, a, a visual um, a channel that you can think of, for example, is position or size or orientation. These are all things that we can use. And once you've made this decision based on um, some knowledge and visualization that I'll get to in the next slide, you can find a generating image. And if you've done everything right, uh, you manage to amplify human cognition in looking at the data. So now you might ask the question, why we do this? I think hopefully by now it's quite obvious that this is the one kind of most high bandwidth way that we know of getting information into your brains. So right, so there's this visual system in between. It's really high bandwidth. We know all about this. We have data on the outside. And our main purpose is to try and get the information which is locked up in that data, get it into your cognition. And then visualization is one way of doing this. So very cleverly turning this raw data into pictures and showing it to your visual system and letting your cortex and your deeper cognition do the rest. This is the whole purpose of visualization. In designing these pipelines, um, there's a whole lot of knowledge in visualization that gets applied. Partly from visualization, partly also from cognitive psychology. And I wanted to show you this one example. It's a, a visual channel ranking. So the channels I spoke about, the position and the length and the texture and so forth, one would think, well, we can just apply these, but it turns out that we um, there have different effectivity depending on the type of data that you use. So it's logical, it sounds a bit logical, that position is a very strong visual channel. This is the one that we recognize the most the most easily. If you look at a at a plot, for example, or a scatter plot, the position of a point, this is for, to everyone is this is patently clear what that means. But as soon as we go down the list and we look at different types of data, when you look at categorical data, that means data that has classes but no ordering then color is, a re or color is a really good visual channel. But if you look at order data, then lightness and saturation both come before color. So just to indicate, there's a whole, there's, the devil is in the details. There's a whole lot of knowledge that you can apply in designing uh, this visual encoding. Oh, and I might get in trouble for saying this, but this is another bit of visualization knowledge. We also know that, perceptually speaking, this is one of the worst color maps that you can ever choose. Now, I think I've burned all the speakers before me, but I've also used this before, I'm just saying, if you're considering this, give us a call and we might give you a better suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to my initial story. I wanted to talk about volume visualization. I hope the whole visualization kind of background is, is quite clear now. So what happens um, uh, uh, on this slide is that I put two scanners on there. One at the top left is a CT scanner that was invented in the late 60s, the Nobel Prize, 
uh, was shared uh, in the late 70s by uh, McCormack and Hansfield. They both developed the idea independently. Hansfield gets more credit for it, perhaps because his name is attached to the unit of the CT scanner, but McCormack also got to share the Nobel Prize. And in the early 70s, Paul Waterburg and Peter Mansfield, uh, they designed, or at least they made the breakthroughs that enabled or, or kind of uh, made it possible for, the MRI, for, for an MRI scanner to work. So both of these scanners caused a revolution not only well, in the medical field, which is, I think, obviously the most important one, but it also caused a revolution in my field, visualization. It resulted in a whole flurry of body visualization research because all, all of a sudden we were not looking at images anymore, we were looking at stacks of images, we were looking at volumes. And all of a sudden it was not possible anymore to look at all these images separately. We had to do something in order to turn them into something that a human uh, can understand better. So one of the first papers written uh, in this direction was the one by Lawrence and Klein. Maybe you cited it before. It's, it's a paper called Marching Cubes, written in 87. The pattern, this paper has been cited 7,500 times. So it's a very well known algorithm for uh, extracting isosurfaces from volume data in a very simple and process intensive way. I think most of you have either used it or seen it. I mean, it's, it's very hard to, uh, to avoid it. Soon after, in 1988, there were two uh, parallel papers or two separate papers uh, documenting the idea of direct volume rendering, of ray casting. And this is actually what the rest of my talk is about. I want to talk about ray casting. And then I also want to talk about what we've done recently for ray casting. So this is ray casting, obviously in those, uh, in those two papers. And I write here textbook ray casting. This is how you would do it if you would implement it from first principles. So remember, I have the CT volume, and I'd really like to look at my data. And this is one nice way of doing it. So at the top right, you see a camera over there. And what I can do is I shoot rays from my camera through the image plane. And at each point of the image plane, I sample regularly at a much finer resolution than my, than my data resolution, of course. At each point, I sample interpolate that value. I put it through my transfer function, which is a, a part of the design of the visualization. And the transfer <coughs> function assigns optical characteristics to that sample, in this case, color and opacity. I take that color and opacity. I put it into this equation here, which is just a function shading equation. What this does, it's a simple model of what happens to light as it strikes that part of my volume. So it's modulating the light or volume, the light direction is modeling my local normals and it's telling me how that color is changed by the light interaction. And finally, for that single sample, I stick it in the integral up there. And if I do that for all samples along the array, and these are many samples, then I derive one single pixel. So now I have to do it for a thousand by a thousand pixels. And if I'm kind of a bit efficient in my programming, I get images like these. So I think that's pretty rewarding for a relatively simple algorithm. So once I've done this for all these samples, for all these rays, I can make images like this from arbitrary data sets. The table is again in the details, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, so this has been quite popular, and uh, these days when you buy medical image workstation, for example, the day of vital images, and uh, Aquarius Net, for example, volume rendering has almost become uh, uh, par for the course, it has to be in there. Uh, it's not equally usable in all uh, practice, but there are many cases in which a volume renderer does contribute value uh, to the normal uh, use of multi multi-panel reconstruction. <coughs> so we asked ourselves, okay, this has now been available since 88. Um, uh, it uses a relatively simple lighting model, so when you look at these images, your depth perception, well, it's doing more or less what it should do, all automatically, of course, but there's a lot more that we can put in there. So we asked ourselves, what? What if we were to push current graphics hardware kind of to its limits? What would we be able to get out of this? And this is the construction that Thomas Cruz came up with, uh, one of the PhD students from my group. And so what you see here, it's not textbook ray casting anymore. What's different here is that uh, Thomas here is modeling the randomness of reality. So instead of having this regular uh, structured pattern of rays being shot through a volume, uh, what he's doing is sampling random points everywhere. So a random point on the lens aperture, a random point on the image, and it's got a random ray. And that ray is shot through the volume, and then along that ray, a single point is chosen probabilistically. It's probabilis probably an interesting point. There's an algorithm that does that. And for that single point, it has a lot more than fun. For that single point, he shoots a ray out once again, or shoots a ray back from a random light source, from a random point on a random light source, back to that point. And he shoots out another array according to the local data characteristics. And that also strikes something in a path or it doesn't. So there's a whole lot of randomness in there. But all of this information is then added to that array. So when you go and you do a back of the envelope calculation, you see that you would need about 50 million of those rays before you start seeing a high quality image. Now, who 
would have known that with a modern GPU, you can do about 100 million rays per second, which is very convenient. So on the left-hand side, you see a textbook ray casting. And fortunately, this projector does a pretty good job of showing you that. And when we do Thomas's uh, random technique, his Monte Carlo ray tracer on volumes, we get this version over here. I hope that you can appreciate the difference. For many non graphics people, they say, what's the big deal? The big deal here is that everything that you see in here is physically based. So you see everything projecting shadows onto everything else. The shadows are softer or harder, depending on the, on the transmissivity or the permissivity of the materials that occlude them. So you get a much more realistic image. And what happens here is when you look at this, your visual cortex is tickled in a different way, and you have much better depth perception without you having to break a sweat in any way. So the bottom line here is we can add realism, um, and without any extra cost to your uh, visual perception, you get more from the same image. And due to the way this is programmed, it's also not costing your computer that much more. I'll show you what I mean by that. But before I get there, um, I'd like to add to this that where the image on the left only tolerates uh, only one light source, the image on the right tolerates or can handle an arbitrary number of arbitrary shaped and textured light sources. So we can build all kind of lighting setups like we have in a photography studio if we want to kind of emulate some other effect in there to get a better to get a better visualization over here. And it's all kind of working towards making your perception understand the depth in that image better. Here's a very short short uh, animation. This should get, get a feel for the fact that the GPU is in this case crunching hundred million rays per second. And due to the way which this image is built up, you'll see that you, you have immediate interactivity, and if you wait a very short while, then it falls in and goes to high quality. What's happening here is that uh, the light source is being moved around. You can see all the shadows also moving around in real time. Here, Thomas is making the background darker to give us a more atmospheric shot of our uh, medical data. Maybe some radiologists <laughs> like that, we don't know. <laughs> and when you wait again, you get, a, you get a high quality image. So what we're saying here, in essence, is that with current graphics hardware, we can get really much, much, much better than people are currently used to. At the right, you see here, the speed with which this was made is similar to what you've just seen on the previous screen. But what you see here looks like it comes from a medical illustration atlas, where the one big difference is this is made from real data. And what you see here are real shadows made from that real data, and your visual perception system really, really likes this. I mean, that's why, that's why you look at it and you go, oh, I, li I like that. <laughs> it's all built in. Okay. So, because we wanted some more exposure for this uh, method, we've put all the source code online under a very permissive uh, software open source license. It will be hopefully published quite soon, the, the article as well. But this means that you can even use this in your, in your commercial application, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, if you would so, uh, if you would so prefer. Okay, so I'd like to move on to my next topic. So my next topic, although it might not look like it on this slide, uh, is also about ray casting. So what you see here is functional, functional MRI connectivity. So with functional fMRI you can measure blood oxygenation and it's a tiny brain signal with a very low frequency. And if you do that in the brain, for example, you measure everywhere in the brain and you correlate all these signals with each other, you can determine which regions of the brain are probably co uh, in communication with other regions because they have the same kind of blood oxygenation pattern. So they're taking up their neurons or are kind of busy uh, according to the same time pattern. So there's a high probability that these regions are talking to each other. And what you see here is an image from a paper from last year, which I'm not going to talk about, but it's, it acts as a kind of a, an introduction to this, this uh, part of the work, where uh, this is joint work with, uh, with uh, Julian Mia and Luca Ferrarini of, uh, of LCAP. And what you see there is that we have a correlation matrix of 90 by 90. So there are 90 atlas regions of the brain, and each of these 90 regions is probably in connection to each of these other 90. So you can also see that instead of looking at it like a correlation matrix, this one over here, this 90 by 90, you could also think of it as a data collection of 90 volumes. So for each of these regions, I have a whole volume with a correlation of values over the whole brain indicating how the brain is wired up to that one region. And then I move on to the next. Okay, I hope that's clear. If it's not tough, then we can have a question afterwards. Okay, so um, we uh, did this work, very happy with it, and then Julian came with a new problem. Um, how about I give you full voxel brain connectivity? So instead of having 90 regions, I'm giving you 20,000 voxels, meaning, in a way, we have 20,000 volumes. So for each of these 20,000 voxels, we know how the rest of the brain, according to this fMRI correlation, is probably communicating with this one voxel. And the question was, can you visualize this? And our answer was, yes, ray casting. Of course. 
So what you see here is a 20,000 by 20,000 image. That means 400 megapixels. If you try to load that up into your Photoshop, your computer probably will explode. But um, that depends. Um, so, but I mean, it would be really nice to be able to look at this data. And it turns out that you can use a Raycaster for this <laughs> as well. So you have a correlation matrix in space. And you hang your camera above the correlation matrix. And by doing exactly the same textbook trick, shooting all of these rays through the correlation matrix, you get free panning and free zooming at this speed. And so it's completely real time. And there's capacity left. And I'll tell you why I say that. OK, so at least now, for the first time, people can look at their 20,000 by 20,000 <coughs> correlation matrices. Beforehand, they made a bunch of different metrics. But then you get these very nice metrics out, and you can make conclusions. But it's a shaky world if you're not able to visually um, uh, visually check whether your data came in right in the first place. And this is a nice tool for that, for that part of the problem. But still, it would be really nice if you could see this in spatial context as well, because we're looking at an abstract 20,000 by 20,000 matrix, whereas we know that each of the, each of the pixels in this four, 400 megapixel Im uh, image uh, is related to the, to the correlation between two separate parts of the brain. And we'd really like to see that. And so they asked us, can you do this? And my answer was, ray casting. <laughs> so what you see here on the left hand, you see the matrix. And what you see on the right, it's not the matrix, but the correlation matrix. <laughs> <laughs> and what you see on the right hand side is a context visualization of an atlas of the human brain. And what you see now on the left hand side, with this ray caster, there are two ray casters talking to each other. On the left hand side, you can select anything that looks interesting in that 400 megapixel image. And it will show you in real time what are the source and destination regions in the brain with voxel based accuracy, or at least RS fMRI voxel based, voxel based accuracy. OK, so this is helping us. I mean, at least now we can, uh, we can see our matrix for the first time. And we can even visually inspect it and see um, if you find interesting things in this matrix, what does it correlate to in my, in my atlas? So I can have a, kind of a, an, an idea of the anatomy, anatomy behind it. But the one problem with this one is that I'm only seeing hard uh, correlation. So when I select something in that matrix, it's only showing me which voxels are talking to which, but it's not, it can't tell me with which string, and the data is in there. So we already have this raycaster. I can't answer the question with that again. But I'm going to answer the question, can you show us how strong the correlation is with bidirectional linking? So if we turn around what I just showed you, there we go. So just now I showed you linking from the left to the right. What about if I'm able to probe in my brain and then see my correlation matrix, what's happening? So what you see here is in real time, you're seeing 20,000 volumes being rendered. This is in fact what's, being, what's happening. Every time that you select a voxel on this side, in real time, you see how quickly it goes, it extracts a complete new three-dimensional volume from the correlation matrix on the GPU, and it shows that to you by using a raycaster. <coughs> and once again, for the first time, you can look at full voxel-based fMRI connectivity networks, task-based or resting state. OK, I'm almost there. In fact, I'm really almost there. So this is the final um, um, uh, trick I want to show you. So you have this brain. It suffers from some of the problems of 3 visualization, primarily being occlusion, because you're looking at a closed object from the outside. You can't always see everything at the same time. Wouldn't it be nice if you could stand on the inside of the brain and then kind of slit it open and lay it flat on the table before you? Yes? It's really nice. I know, you, I know you think this. So with the Raycaster, once again, you can put your camera on the inside of the brain and cast rays out radially along a cylinder. And if you do that, what you get implicitly is exactly what I just said. You get a brain that flips out and is laid flat on the table or the screen for you. I timed this very badly. It should flip out any time now. There we go. So you're standing inside the brain, and you're looking to the front, and it's been flipped open from the back like this. And you can still see the, 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 kind of the division lines between the, the atlas regions. We're still working on the emphasis in that context visualization. But you're also seeing the real-time, full voxel-based correlation throughout the whole brain. And of course, when you're done, you can flip it back, because it must be very uncomfortable having your brain like that. OK, so I've reached my final slide. And these are my take-home messages. So uh, it seems that after 25 years, because that's how old body rendering is, um, new questions and new possibilities have ushered in a new era of volume visualization research. And the other statement I want to make, and this is quite a provocative one, because it could be that I have to eat my hat in five years, 
But I'm making the statement now that physically based lighting and volume rendering will be the norm in five years. So the renderings that I've shown you now, we've now kind of just shown that it's possible and that it's actually, it's almost real time. So I'm, I'm willing to venture, venture the bet that in five years time this will be the norm and we won't see foam shaded volume renderings anymore. We'll only see these photorealistic ones because they cost the same and in general they contribute to your perception. The other take home message is that uh, ray casting uh, plus GPU, this combination is a very powerful framework for visualizing complex data. And that thing about rainbow color maps, but you'll know where to find me. Okay. And finally, this has been a collaboration with, with very many groups outside of, of my group in Delft. But these are just some of the people that I brought along with me, and I will be standing by, uh, by the, with the drinks afterwards to answer all of your medical scientists and questions. Thank you very much for your attention here. <laughs>